Good morning. The scripture reading before today's lesson will be taken from Psalm 100. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It will be broadcast on the screens. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we, not ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Good morning. It's good to see everybody today. We're so grateful for your presence. I look forward uh, to Sunday because it's the Lord's Day and because it's the day we can be together and just kind of shut the world out. We have a week of, of mess and then we come in here and we shut it all out and we serve the Lord. And I look forward to it week to week. I look forward to seeing you and I'm, and I'm glad that you're here. And especially if you're visiting with us, uh, we want you to know you're our honored guest. Uh, we want you to feel welcome. We'd like you to stick around after the services if you can and visit with us a while and get to know us. And we want you to know that we're always open to your Bible questions if you have them. We uh, would love to have a study with you if that would be your desire. We can arrange to do that here. We can arrange to do it in your home. Uh, we can arrange to do it by internet. We can have email exchanges or whatever, but we'd love to study the Bible with you. So thank you so much for coming. I want to talk about Psalm 100. Brother Mike read it at the table last week and uh, he even asked me, uh, he said, why don't you talk about that? And I thought, you know, I'm just going to do that. I think I will talk about Psalm 100. And as I got to looking into it, I realized that Psalm 100 uh, is really just that, a call to worship. That's exactly what it is. Uh, in fact, it's really a call to public worship. There uh, is worship that we can describe as private worship, your private devotions, your prayers, your, your personal Bible study. But then there's public worship. When uh, brethren gather together uh, and worship collectively. They worship together. And of course we know that the Psalms were written to the Jewish people. So this is an Old Testament portion of Scripture. Uh, and they are being called to worship at the temple. That's why it talks about in verse 4, His gates and His courts is talking about the temple uh, of the Lord in Jerusalem. But there is a sense too in which these verses apply to us obviously because we also are called to worship God. Uh, we're called to do so at least on a weekly basis and according to Scripture, allowed to do so on a daily basis. Acts 2 and verse 46 tells us that. Uh, so worship is important to every disciple of the Lord. Uh, in John 4 and verse 23, Jesus was having a conversation with the Samaritan woman. Uh, and He said, Woman, the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now listen to this last part, John 4, 23. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God seeks worship. God does not need worship. Uh, God is not going to die or nothing's bad going to happen to God if He doesn't get worship. But He deserves worship and He seeks worship and He wants us to worship Him. And so just as it was true under the old law, it is true today. So I think we would do well to ponder some of the things in this psalm, uh, some of the thoughts that can help us in our worship in terms of the whys, why we should do this, why we should gather to worship God, and a little bit about the hows uh, of worship, the, the attitudes perhaps of reverence and so forth. And so let's just kind of wade into this psalm. And it starts off in the first couple of verses with a call to worship. The call is clearly stated there in verses 1 and 2 when he says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. That's the call. That's the call to worship. I want to break that down. There's three statements there in the two verses. The first one is found in verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. I'm reading from the New King James Version. I think the Old King James reads very much the same, but in some versions, such as the New American Standard Version or the English Standard Version, it says, all the earth. So all you lands, all the earth. And the idea I think that's very important here is that worship is for everybody. Uh, there's an attitude out there that worship is just not for everybody. Some people will say, worship is not for me. 
I want no part of worship. But the Bible is telling us that worship is for everybody. It's for the rich. It's for the poor. It's for every race. It's for every nation. It's for every person, you see. It's for male and for female. Take your Bibles. Hold your spot here because we'll be returning to Psalm 100. But turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, just one verse here, uh, verse 4 in particular. The Bible says, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Notice that phrase in verse 4, all nations. That's exactly what Psalm 100 says. So what was true for the Jews in the Old Testament is true for us. Worship is for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, rich and poor, male and female, for everyone you see. And so that's one aspect, the call to worship. And the call goes out not just to certain ones, but the call goes out to everyone. Let's go back to Psalm 100. Notice the second part of that in the call to worship. The second phrase is found in verse 2. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. Notice the word serve. We serve God in a couple of different ways. There is a sense in which we dedicate our lives to the Lord. Romans 12, we preached from Romans 12 a few weeks ago. Romans 12 talks about giving your body a living sacrifice. Now just let that sink in for a second. A sacrifice is an act of worship, isn't it? And so when you give your bodies a living sacrifice, what he's saying is that, that your life becomes a worship. Your life becomes a, an act of worship. And so we serve the Lord, number one, in a dedicated life. When we dedicate our life to the Lord, uh, that is a life of worship. But then there are those times when we gather and do specific acts of devotion. That's what, that's what we usually return, reserve the word worship for. Those times when we gather together and those times when we actually do specific acts of devotion to God. We sing praises to God. That's all about God. We remember the death of Jesus in the memorial supper. That's all about God. Jesus is God, remember. And the Lord's Supper is an act of worship directed directly at Jesus Christ. We pray to God. And all of this is directed to specific acts of devotion. It's more than just the devoted life, but it takes it to the next level. It takes that devoted life to the next level and says, no, we're going to take this devoted life and we're going to take some time out of that devoted life and just focus on God. And so worship is a way that we serve the Lord. We serve Him with our life and we serve Him with acts of worship and acts of devotion. And then in the same verse, verse 2, Psalm 100, verse 2, the third phrase, come before His presence with singing. Look at the phrase, His presence. I don't know if you realize it or not. I think Mike even said this at the table last week. But we are in the presence of God. When we gather together as a congregation of God's people, we are gathered in His presence. There is no holy temple here, but we don't need that. What we need is to realize where we are, realize what we're doing, and we're coming into the presence of God. Take your Bibles with me, if you will, and turn to Matthew 26. This is when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, and I want to start the reading, we'll, we'll just go back to the beginning of this in verse 26, the beginning of the institution of the supper. Matthew 26, 26, and remember that this is during the Passover, the last Passover, or what we sometimes call the last supper, and the word supper they're referring to the Passover supper. And during that last Passover, Jesus institutes a new memorial for the new covenant. And so we read in verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. Blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. We did that just a few moments ago. Uh, we took our bread and we broke it and we ate it. And, and we remembered the body of Christ that was sacrificed for us. Verse 27 says, Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Just a few moments ago, we all opened up our cup. And we drank from that cup and we remembered the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of our sins. But here's the kicker in verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's not talking about heaven there. He's talking about the church. The kingdom was about to be established and Jesus says that when that kingdom is established, we will drink this again. We will drink this together. And we know that Jesus is not physically here. He's up in heaven sitting at the right hand of God. But in a spiritual sense, in a very real sense, He is here with us. We have come into His presence. 
and we eat the bread which reminds us of his body. We drink the cup which reminds us of his blood and he is here. Now there's another passage, a bonus passage I didn't put in your notes, but turn with me over to 1 Corinthians 10. And I think this sheds a little bit of light on this idea. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. And he says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The word communion there uh, literally means a sharing. He's not saying that this Lord's Supper is called the communion. He's saying when you eat the Lord's Supper, you are communing. That's what you're doing. You're communing with the body and with the blood of Jesus. It is a sharing of the blood of Christ. It is a sharing of the body of Christ. Now, not literally, obviously because the blood of Christ was shed 2,000 years ago. But that bread represents the body. And that cup represents the blood. And so we share, we declare our fellowship with the Lord. And He is here in a very real and spiritual sense. So we come into His presence. Just as they came into His presence in ancient times by going to the temple, we come into His presence by assembling together and doing those things that God has told us to do. And you look at those two verses, Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2, and there's a common theme that runs through that. I want, you, I want you to read it with me again, the first two verses, with emphasis on certain words. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. And the, the words I want you to notice, joyful shout in verse 1, and in verse 2, with gladness, and also in verse 2, with singing. When we sing, we're happy. Isn't that what James says? He said, is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. So ch singing is an expression of cheer. It's an expression of joy. It's an expression of gladness. And the theme there is, worship is not a drudgery. If you have the attitude that worship is a drudgery, you need an attitude adjustment. Now, I can't adjust your attitude for you. You have to do that. You have to get your nose in the book. You have to try and understand and appreciate that God is deserving of our worship and that He wants our worship and that we should want to give it to Him. It's a privilege. It is an absolute privilege to be here. That's why David could say in Psalm, I think it was Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. It's not, oh, it's another Sunday. Oh, it's another worship. It's, I'm glad. It's a privilege. It's a joy. It's a time of singing. It's a time of gladness. It's a time of shouting. It's a time that, that we all should want to participate in, you see. That's the idea. And so you see that call to worship in those first two verses. In verse 3, we see here the why to worship. Why should we do this? And why should we want to do this? Read with me verse 3. He says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Now, there are several thoughts that are brought out in that verse. And the first one is right there in verse 3. The Lord is God. Now, look at your Bible very carefully. You see the word Lord there? Have you noticed in your Bible that that's all capital letters? I'm going to teach you a little lesson here. Some of you already know this. But whenever in your Bible you see the word Lord in all capital letters, you usually see it in the Old Testament uh, most of the time, but whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters like it is there, that's the Hebrew word for Yahweh. That's God's name. Uh, uh, old scholars used to believe it was Jehovah. and You see that reflected uh, in the Amer Old American Standard Version translation. In fact, we even sang that song this morning, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. The old scholars believed that the Hebrew word was pronounced Jehovah. And, but more modern scholars believe that the better pronunciation, the more accurate pronunciation is Yahweh. And this is God's name, you see. And, and so he says specifically here in verse 3, Know that Yahweh is God. Think about that. Buddha is not God. Confucius is not God. Muhammad is not God. But Yahweh is God. That's the ideal that's being brought out. Only the true God is worthy of worship. People have created other gods, many of them over the centuries and over the years. Many other gods have been created. But he said, we need to worship the true God. Only the true God is worthy of our worship. Remember in Matthew 4 when Jesus was being tempted by the devil. And on one of those temptations, he responded by saying, thou, Matthew 4 and verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, listen, and Him only 
shalt thou serve. No other God. No other God should be served. In fact, no other God really exists. Every other God is a myth. Every other God is a falsehood. Every other God is a fake. But Yahweh is the true God, and He is worthy of a... That's the why. Why? Because God is worthy. Yahweh is the true God, and He is worthy of our worship. Let's go back to verse 3 and notice something else. Not only is Yahweh God, but it is He who made us, and not we ourselves. He's the Creator. Not only is He God, the true God, but He is our Creator, and the Creator alone is worthy of worship. Now take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Paul was preaching to uh, the Athenians in, in Athens, Greece on Mars Hill and a place called the Hill of Ares or the Areopagus, depending on the translation, it, it all means basically the same thing. But this was a place where a court was held in the city of Athens and it was known as the Hill of Ares. And Paul uh, preaches to these people, he has an opportunity to preach to these people. These are not Jewish people. These are Gentiles, and they know very little about God, so he begins where they are and talks about things that, that they know. And so I'm going to begin the reading in verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. That's kind of a compliment. I'm glad that you are religiously minded people. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your devotion, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Now he says, there's a God you don't know about. You, you're aware of that because you've got an altar there with an inscription on it to the unknown God. Therefore, the one you worship without knowing, the one you don't know anything about, Him I proclaim. Let me tell you about the true God. That's what he's saying. Verse 24, God who made the world. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. That's what Psalm 100 says. And Paul reaffirms that. God who made the world and everything in it, since He's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything. Now notice that. Nor is He worshipped with men's hands. Now He doesn't just leave it there. It's as though He needed anything. God doesn't need our worship. God doesn't need us. We need Him. That's the idea here. And so it, 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 we, we do worship Him with our hands. We take our hands. We pick up our songbook. We take our hands. We pick up our Bibles. We take our hands. We pick up the communion cup. But we don't worship God as though He needed it, you see. He doesn't need anything from us. He gives us life and breath and all things. He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. That's a powerful verse. It says that we're all kin. You go back far enough along the chain, we're all kinfolk, distantly related one to another. And that's a beautiful expression of the common blood, the common humanity that we all share. He's determined their pre-appointed times, the boundaries of their habitation. Why? What does God want? So they should seek the Lord. One of the ways we seek Him is in worship. We're seeking His will and we're seeking to please Him. So we seek the Lord in hope that we might grow for Him and find Him, though He's not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. You wouldn't exist if it wasn't for God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. Some of your own poets have said that we are His offspring. And then the key verses, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold, or silver, or stone, something shaped by man's art and devising. Don't get the idea that this statue is God. And a lot of people still don't understand that in the world. They think the statue is God. They worship the statue. They kiss the statue. They do homage to the statue. He don't think of the statue as God. And truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. The Creator, the One who made heaven and earth, He is worthy of our worship. And so it is He who made us and not we ourselves. Let's go back to Psalm 100 and verse 3 and notice something else here. It says, we are His people. Stop. We are His people. The ideal here is you have a creator and you have the created. You have a creator and His people. And the, and the point is know your place. This is what worship is all about. Worship is all about knowing your place. He is God and we are not. He is God and we are His people. And so there's a passage in James chapter 4, and I think it's verse 10, where James says, and we have a song that we sing in the songbooks that uses these very words, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. And think about that. 
That's what you're doing when you're worshiping God. You're recognizing that He is God, that He is the Creator, that He is the one who made us, and that we are His people. And suddenly we begin to put things in perspective, and we see who we are, and we're nothing. We're nothing before an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. We sing that song too. And we are nothing before Him. And we need Him and we depend upon Him for everything. And this is what worship is an understanding. I understand that, Lord. I understand my place in the scheme of things. My place is not on the throne. My place is at the feet of You. My place is bowing before You. My place is worshiping You. My place is pleasing You. That's the ideal of those verses. And then... There's one more thought in verse 3. It says, we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. That's a metaphor that's often used to describe the people of God. And with a sheep and shepherd metaphor, you, you have a picture of God's loving care over us. And just as a little piece of that, I want you to go with me to John chapter 10. There's a whole section, in fact, really the whole chapter, if you wanted to spend the time on it, the whole chapter talks about that shepherd and sheep relationship, but I'm just going to pin in on a zero, on a, a zero in on a small section of that, verses 14 to 18. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Remember, Jesus is God. Jesus is Yahweh. Remember that. And so I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. I know them, and they know me. That's the idea. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. That's the ultimate expression of love and care, isn't it? The ultimate expression that I would give my life for my people, that I would give my life for the sheep of my pasture. And that's exactly what he did. And then notice this, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. He's preaching to the Jews. And he's letting them know that you're not the only ones. I've got other sheep. They're Gentiles. There's others out there. And I also must bring them. They're coming along. Remember, that brings us back to verse 1. Worship is for everybody, for all lands, throughout all the earth, you see. And I must bring them, and they will hear my voice. Just as you've heard my voice, they will. And there will be one flock and one shepherd, the unity of the body of Christ. Therefore, my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Once again, that's the ultimate expression of His care for us. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Think of that for a second. Men, the men who crucified Jesus, they thought they did something. We took his life. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. I lay it down of myself. I did this. I let you crucify me. I let you take my life. And I did it because I love you. I did it because I care about you. I did it as the ultimate expression of my love. And so we begin to get this picture of this awesome God who loves us, who cares for us, who created us, who provided us with everything. No wonder. That's why we worship. That's why we worship. We know who He is, and we know who we are, and we know we'd be nothing without Him. And that's why we worship, and that's why it's a privilege, and that's why it's a pleasure to do this. Let's go back to Psalm 100, and notice... And you see this typical in Scripture in a lot of places. You see a repetition. And so the call to worship is repeated. The call to worship is repeated in verse 4. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. And I mentioned it earlier in the sermon. Entering into His gates and entering into His courts, this is written to a Jewish audience. And so this is the coming into the temple. And that was the place where much of their worship was conducted. And so the idea of coming in there, you see. And he says, enter into his gates, first of all, with thanksgiving. Another reason that we worship is because we're thankful. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, a very short verse, it says, In everything give thanks. Why, Paul? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let that sink in. In everything give thanks. Sometimes if we're not careful, we don't, we're not thankful for the little things, you know. I think, I'm just, I'm just using this as an illustration, it just popped into my head, so I hope I don't booger this up. But I don't think there's been a day go by when my wife has made me a meal. And I always say, thank you, honey, for that good, good, good supper. Or that good, 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 and I say it every time, don't I? Every time. It's a little thing. It's a, she made my dinner, but every time. Now apply that to God. The little things, everything, the life, the breath, the food, the clothing, 
the shelter, the little things, the big things, everything. In everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God. So we enter into His gates, we worship Him with thanksgiving, even for the little things, for everything. The second part of that same verse. Enter into His courts with praise. So not only are we thankful, but we're going to give our praise to God. And we praise Him for spiritual blessings and we praise Him for physical blessings. There's, there, those are the two primary kinds of blessings that you could, if you were, could categorize them. And you think about the physical blessings, I've touched on some of that. The fact that you've got, that you've got a place, when you leave here t- in a few moments, when you leave, you've got a home to go to. You've got a place to lay your head. God gave you that. God allowed you to have the talent to work and provide that and put that roof over your head. You might say, well, I did that. Well, you did it because God gave you the talent and the ability, you see. And so the, 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 the shelter that you have. And then when you leave here, just like I am, you're going to go find something to eat. Whether you go to a restaurant or whether you go home or whatever you do, you're going to go find something. So there's not only shelter, but there's food, the physical blessings of life. And then you, you, when you get home, you open up the closet And in these modern times, it's chock full of clothes, isn't it? All kinds of pants, all kinds of shirts, all kinds of dresses, all kinds of shoes, especially if you're a lady, all kinds of shoes, (laughs) shoes upon shoes upon shoes. I'm just kidding. But blessings, physical blessings is the point I'm making here. And then above and beyond that spiritual blessings, the fact that God cared enough to send His Son into the world to die for your sins. The fact that through that death, your sins can be taken away. The fact that now that your sins are taken away, He is open for business 24-7 to hear your prayers. I don't care what time of day or night, you, you turn to God in prayer and He's right there and He hears it. And He hears your prayer and He hears my prayer. And if you stop and, and really ponder this, how many prayers must be going up to God at any given moment in time? with untold billions of people in this world, how many prayers are going up at the same moment in time? And He hears every one of them. And He responds to every one of them. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait a while, but He hears them and He responds. Spiritual blessings. And you know, when this life is over, the greatest spiritual blessing of all, to get to go would be in heaven. In heaven, we don't have disaster and sickness and chaos. In heaven, we have Love and bliss and beauty and greatness and the presence of God and worship of God throughout all eternity and all these great spiritual blessings. And so we enter into His gates with thanksgiving and we enter into His courts with praise and we praise Him for all of those things. And then the same verse says, Be thankful to Him and bless His name. We worship God to show that gratitude and we worship God to bless His name. And the common theme... Notice again, as I mentioned the common theme in verse 1, the common theme here in verse 4, notice His gates, His courts, to Him, His name, the common theme, it's all about God. Worship isn't about me. People, I hear people say, I didn't get anything out of worship. It ain't about you and it ain't about what you get. It's about Him. It's about giving, not getting. It's about giving praise to God. It's about giving adoration to God. It's about giving God what He deserves. It's not about you getting something. If you get something, that's gravy. That's icing on the cake. That's wonderful. But it's not about you. It's about Him. And we need to learn that. Worship is not about me, but it's about Him. And then verse 5 another expression of the reason. So you see the pattern here. There's a pattern. A call to worship, why? And a call to worship, and why? And so he gives us some more whys here in verse 5. For, the word for means because. For, number one, the Lord is good. It's hard for us to imagine a being that is teetotally 100% good because all we're exposed to are beings that have bad in them. Even us. Even sometimes we do bad things, don't we? Sometimes we sin against God. And so it's hard for us to fathom a being that is 100% good. But that is God. There is no evil in God. In Him, John said, in Him there is no darkness at all. There is no evil in God. He is good. He's good to us. He's good to everybody. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. And in this section, Jesus is talking about loving your enemies. He said in verse 43, 
You've heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, if you have a, a Bible that kind of highlights that, notice you shall love your neighbor as a quote, but hate your enemy, you won't find that in the Old Testament. That was the traditions of the Jews. That's what the Jews taught. That was not what the Bible said. The Bible never said hate your enemy. Never said that. God never taught that. So that was what they'd heard. That's what they'd heard was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Jesus correcting that misconception, I say to you, love your enemies. Don't hate your enemies. And that's always been true. That's not new. That's always been true. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Boy, that sounds hard. I don't want to do that. Well, guess what? God does it every day. You ever thought about that? That's the next verse. The reason I want you to love your enemies is so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and the good. Can you imagine if God was vindictive like some human beings? They're not getting any sunshine for a month. They're not going to have any rain for six years. God's not like that. He's not vindictive in that way. He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God is good. He's always good. And He's good to everybody. If something bad happens, know this, it came from the devil. It didn't come from God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. God is consistently good, always good, and good to everybody. And so God is good. That's why you worship because He's good. He's a good God. And then in the same verse, His mercy is everlasting. God is merciful to us. And aren't you glad? I hope you read today's bulletin. It, it touches on the idea of mercy, of divine mercy. And I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Because it talks about God's mercy. And I, I just like the language that he uses here. In Ephesians 2 and verse 4, it says, But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places. But notice that, rich in mercy. A lot of times we think of the word rich, we think, we're thinking dollars and cents, aren't we? We're thinking portfolios and stocks. And, and, and we're thinking dollars and cents. There's other ways to be rich. Just the other day, I was watching, and it's an old song, but she, she did it again. Dolly Parton did that song about the coat of many colors. If you've never heard that, you might, you might go look that up. It's a true story, by the way. The song is not just a song. It's a true story from her life. And her mama sold her a coat. They were poor. They were, just, they were dirt poor, living there in Tennessee. And, and her mama had to sew her a coat with rags. And she sewed them all together and made her. And there's a line in that song. And Dolly says, and though we had no money, listen, listen, and though we had no money, I was rich as I could be in my coat of many colors that my mama made for me. God, there's other ways to be rich. And God is rich in mercy. And He wants to pour it out on you. He wants to make you rich. He wants to forgive your sins and lift you up and seat you in the heavenly places. That's why you worship God. Because He's so good. And because He's so merciful. And then in verse 5 it says, His truth endures to all generations. God is truthful. God will never lie to you. You know, I've, I've seen people, I've seen people who call themselves Christians. Look me right straight in the eye and tell me the biggest whopper that ever was. Have you? You've seen that? I've seen it. God will never lie to you. God is truthful. Consistently truthful. Always truthful. When He says something, it's true. Bank on it. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. If you read it in your Bible, you can guarantee it's the truth. God, we will never lie to you. And when you start putting that together, in fact, look at this second point. He, Yahweh is the true God. Yahweh is the creator. And we are not. And God is good. And God is merciful. And God is truthful. All that adds up to is God is worthy of our worship. And with that thought, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation 4, John is given a rare glimpse into heaven itself. It's an amazing thing. One of the few people 
that got to experience something like this. I think Paul had a similar experience in 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, but one of the few people that had an experience like this, and he got to, to kind of get a glimpse of heaven. And there's some interesting things said here. In Revelation 4 and verse 9, you know, John, as he, as he looks at the heavenly throne, he, he notices that around the throne there's 24 elders and there's four living creatures, and, 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 and there's just this amazing, beautiful sight. And so in verse 9, it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, then the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Here it is, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why are You worthy? For You created all things and by Your will they exist and were created. Isn't that what the psalm says? For You are our Creator. Same idea. Drop down here to chapter 5 and starting with about verse 11 and this same thing applies to Jesus Christ. I've been saying all, remember Jesus is God. Jesus is Yahweh. God is made up of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus is a part of that. And so we read in verse 11, the same idea applied to Jesus. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now look at that. We've moved from beyond those gathered around the throne, the 24 elders and the living creatures and all the angels. We've moved beyond that. Now we're on, we're on every creature in heaven and every creature on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that is in them. I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to our God. Be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped Him who lives forever and ever. The, the thought there, God is worthy. He's worthy. It's worth your time to be here every time the doors are open. It is worth the time. It is worth the effort to come and to sing and to pray and to commune and to study. It's worth the time. It's worth the effort. God is worthy of it. And it's a way, a small way, that we can show our devotion and that we can show Him that we love Him too. And so worship is so important. God wants it. He wants the praise that is rightfully His, but we need to be willing to give it. Worship must be willingly given. That's part of the idea of, of worshiping God in spirit and truth. John 4, 24. Remember Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The spirit part of that, sincerely from the heart, not just going through the motions, not just checking the boxes, but from the heart. And so let us all examine our hearts and let us all examine our minds and make sure we're giving God what He deserves every time we meet, every time the doors are open. But as we slide into the invitation, I want you to know this, that you cannot worship God in an acceptable way if you're still in your sins. Remember, the call goes out to all the earth but before we can come into His presence, our sins have to be purged. 1 Peter 3.12 says that. It says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So in order for you to be able to worship acceptably, your sins must be purged. And that brings us into the invitation. This is your golden opportunity right now this morning to change that. If you're here and you're still in your sins, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for your sins. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ and let one of us take you into this tank of water behind me and baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins. With those sins being purged, you are in a perfect condition to come into His presence with gladness and with joy and with singing. If that appeals to you, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?